Jim Werfritz, welcome. You're a relatively newcomer to the Chautauqua County area. Where's, where was hometown? Where were you born? Uh, I was I was born in, well, I was born in, where was I born? Children's <laughs> Hospital in Buffalo. And I grew up on the east side of Buffalo. Spent 22 years there. Um, and then moved away to Texas and a variety of other places. And then came back in 2012 and uh, settled down here permanently in 2015. In your prior life, you uh, went to SUNY at Buffalo, right? Yes. <clears throat> and what did you get your degrees in? I got a degree in civil engineering with a water resources concentration. That was the predecessor of environmental engineering at SUNY Buffalo. They didn't have that then, uh, but the closest you could get was a water resources concentration in civil. Kind of give us your career path after you, you graduated sure. from SUNY Fredonia. You are a lifelong Buffalo Bills fan. This is good. You suffered your way through the Super Bowl years. Yeah, yeah we spent the Super Bowl years with people in Texas, which was not much fun. Oh, Dallas. Uh, huh? Yeah, it was, it was awful. And then we got to watch the Sabres get cheated out of a Stanley Cup. The by Bowl. the Dallas Stars, yep. watching from Texas. Uh, but now I graduated in 78 uh, with a BS and went to work for Exxon and that Exxon Mobil, and I spent 35 years with them in about 20 different positions um, in engineering, planning, construction, business, a whole variety of uh, different types of jobs. And you, you, had, you actually moved to places like Moscow and the Russian Federation. And yeah. Did you see Michael Cohen in any of those travels? Probably. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't have recognized him then. Um, I traveled a lot. Um, I actually, had, I didn't get a passport until I was 39 years old. But then, between then and when I retired in 2013, I think, yeah, 13, um, I filled up three of them with visas. <laughs> so I traveled to really over 30 countries. And uh, Debbie and I and our family, we lived in Indonesia for two years in the Far East, and then in Moscow for two years. So what was the aha moment to draw you to Chautauqua County? Well, when we moved to Moscow, um, that was our <laughs> same weather. I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> that was our second overseas family assignment, and by then we knew that we really needed to have a place for Debbie and the kids to go in the summer, because in the summer most of the expat families go back to where they came from. So we bought a condo down at Chautauqua Lake Estates in 2003, and we had that until we bought our house over in Bemis. And that was really, we bought the condo sight unseen um, with Tom Turner. Um, and, uh, and it worked out fine. Uh, and we spent a lot of time there in the summers and in the winters. Um, but that was the first time I ever saw Chautauqua Lake. Growing up in Buffalo, kind of odd, but I never got down here at all. So. And we liked it, and then a few years later, we decided we, this was going to be it. We were going to find a place um, either on the lake or near the lake, and that was going to be where we ended up. So we looked for probably eight years. I'll bet we looked at 75 or 100 properties around the lake and finally found one, bought it in 2015, and then when our youngest graduated from high school up in Buffalo, we moved out here permanently in 2016. So we're here for good now. Um, like it or not, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the cowboy boots. You've still got a little flavor for it. Yeah, well, Texas. we spent a lot of time in Texas, probably 20, 25 years. So you in the, into rodeo at all or anything out there like that? I mean, <laughs> no, not really. I mean, we went to plenty of them. Yeah. But uh, no, I don't ride bulls <laughs> or rocks. <laughs> but it's fun to watch. We go to the one in Gary every year now, yeah. which is really nice. The barbecues are the best. Tom, have you ever had their uh, Gary Rodeo barbecues? I never have, although I went many, many times, particularly growing up. 
So, so Tom, you just received the Community Service Award, the 2018 John D. Hamilton Community Service Award, which is a which is a high, high honor in our community. And part of that was just your involvement in the community. It begs the question, I guess, are you a native? I just, is this hometown for you? Yes, I, I was born July 3rd in Jamestown General Hospital, and my mother told me from the time I could listen, I guess, that it was very, very hot, and people were blowing off firecrackers, and she was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get the date, yeah. So, you're a Jamestown High School guy? Yep. Lived here most of my life, except for a couple of forays. So you graduated, what, what year in JHS? I, JHS 57. 57. And then I went to the Lutheran Bible Institute in Minneapolis uh, for one semester. Decided I really needed to get on with other things and uh, started JCC. Went to JCC for two and a half years. Um, graduated from there in 1960. Were you going to be a minister? I was told by my high school guidance counselor that I didn't have the aptitude for science. <laughs> so I figured, well, maybe I'd like to be a missionary to Alaska. So that's what got me to the Lutheran Bible Institute, during which time I realized that was not the way to go. So what was the aha moment? Science was something you wanted to do even though your kind guidance counselor said you had no aptitude? Well, I, I, I started collecting insects and trucking around the woods when I was quite young. But the aha moment is when I, I fell into the clutches of Bob Kokersberger at JCC. Some of you remember Bob. and uh, All I wanted to do was do what Bob did. And I was very fortunate to be able to do that. So entomology was your thing, and zoology, those were those were your primary focus? Yeah, I had a friend in high school, he, he liked fossils, so he and I would go out together and I'd collect insects and he'd collect fossils and we'd share information, yeah. So you, you that's why when you collect fossils, you, you don't mind hanging around with guys like Doug Necker, so that's okay? Well, what are you saying, Doug the fossil? <laughs> Doug, this is for you, from me. Um, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, so you come back, I mean, when you, once you graduate and you, and you get you these, all these various degrees, uh, did you come, come back, did you want to come back to JCC and teach? Well, as I said, all I wanted to do was do what Bob Kokersberger was doing, and, and that's why we came back, and I'm glad we did, and uh, uh, it's been an honor to, to do that. How did you find you go yourself in your entomology, zoology, and now you're one of the many spokespeople for the Chautauqua Lake Partnership? How did, how, what's the progression there? Good question. Um, when, when I was in grad school for entomology at Wisconsin, um, my major professor was a forest entomologist. And uh, he, he would have us uh, grad students go out on insect spray jobs. And uh, we did that, of course. And um, learned a lot about chemicals in the environment. Took a couple of entomology courses in that subject, insect control and so on. And I developed the um, philosophy that while chemicals should not always be used, there is a time when they should be used uh, because it's really a time of last resort. And I, I believe that's the case for Chautauqua Lake with, with regard to the weeds. Um, it's time, and I believe it's past time to use chemicals for weed control in the Chautauqua Lake, but it all goes back to, you know, the mid-60s um, with insect control. 
So you were around here at a time, Tom, as was I when Chautauqua, I mean, I recall distinctly when you got notices and there was going to be herbicide used in the lake for two or three days. You could not go swimming and then there's, and then you could. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand. How did that all happen? Do you, have you done, can you give us a little education as to why that occurred back in those time periods? And I'm just trying to think 70s, 80s maybe, is that? Where they just said no swimming and they used the whole lake herbicides? Well, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, the question was I mean, I just, for personal recollection, I remember getting notices and the whole Post Journal and all that would tell us hey, uh, they're applying herbicides to the lake. So there'll be no swimming at Chautauqua Lake for these days. Do you remember the background behind that? No, I don't remember the background per se. I certainly remember that happening. Um, I, I assume somebody had the knowledge and the control, uh, conservation department, presumably, and um, it was based on on uh, the advice uh, the, of the chemical manufacturing concerns, as it is today. <coughs> Back to you, Jim. You relatively new property owner on the lake, Bemis Point Bay area. Uh, what triggered your interest in this? Well, it was, it was my experience the first late summer and fall that I lived there on Bemis Bay. And uh, like I said, we had looked at at least 75 properties and I never really noticed a weed problem, or a weed fragment problem, or a smell problem, or any of that as we were looking at properties. Um, but we bought in June of 2015, and as the summer went on, we had a really bad problem on the shoreline. We had a, a mat of rotting weeds that went out 30 or 40 feet. We had blue-green algae on it, and uh, we were having to close our windows in the house, uh, which we almost never do. We really don't need to use the AC. Uh, we're 300 feet from the shoreline, but we were having to close the windows because of the smell. And I was just really surprised. And so I started talking to my neighbors, um, Mike Latone, uh, Jim Service and a few others, and I found that this wasn't just a one-year occurrence, uh, that it was kind of an ongoing problem, um, and we decided that we wanted to see what could be done. And what did, what did that result? So a bunch of you guys over a beer one day decide that we ought to do something. What was the, what was the action item that you came up with that? Well, the first thing we did was we organized... 10 of our neighbors, uh, 10 people that lived right next to each other in that part of the bay. And uh, we contacted the county executive and Dave McCoy, and we had a meeting. First meeting was on November 16th of 2016, I believe. Um, and that's really how uh, activities started to identify what the problems were, and we'll get into that more a little bit later, but there's really three problems in the lake. What was being done about them, and what else could be done about them. Um, and that's really how it evolved, and it built uh, to where we are right now, where we have active programs in each of the three problem areas in the lake, weed management, weed fragment management, and algae management. So you created this Bemis Bay Property Owners, a group of 10 folks that said, let's charge ahead. Yeah. Was that a corporate, did you want to create a corporate structure? Or was this, how did you get one, one or two voices to understand? Well, you know, it just started growing. And uh, initially in Bemis Point and Ellery, and then, um, we associated with some people in the South Basin 
primarily Karen Ryan, who's here somewhere, there she is, who had been very active in the South Basin in the early 2000s. Um, and in March of 2017, the Bemis Bay property owners merged into the Chautauqua Lake Partnership, which had been formed in 2001, but had been kind of dormant uh, for the years between 04 and 2016. And then we really started growing to the point now where we have over 700 people on our distribution list. So it really started out with three, then 10, and a little bigger, then merged with the partnership that brought in probably another 70, and then up and up from there. And that the merger is what gave you that 501c3 status. That's correct. Uh, full disclosure, I was involved in that creation many, many years ago with Karen's encouragement and at the time uh, arm twisting, so she, she's, she's the person there. Well, actually, you were one of the first three or four people that I talked to about the lake back in late 2016. Yep. I think we were at Tim Hortons on Main Street. Starbucks. Starbucks? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they make sure that I say that. that <laughs> they're a sponsor of this program. So I, I know you have some history on this stuff. <laughs> uh, that, just out of curiosity, that when it was created back at that time period, and I, I know Karen can speak the best of this, but I'll let you speak, Jim. They had some successes in the first couple of years of getting a permit to put some herbicides in the British Bay area. You want to speak to that? Yeah. I believe they treated 90 acres in Burtis Bay in 2002, and uh, that was uh, through a permit with the town of Ellicott. And, and then they attempted to expand it um, and involve Ellery and, and uh, make it a little bigger, but the DEC said at that time since the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement that was done for Chautauqua Lake specific in 1990 was 12 years old. And it needed to be updated before any more permits would be issued for herbicides in the lake. Um, and that was a big hurdle. Uh, we supported the town of Ellery in completing a new supplemental environmental impact statement in 2018 and it cost a quarter of a million dollars. So back in the early 2000s, I think when they were faced with that, um, it was too much of a hurdle uh, and, and things uh, went on hold for a while. Recently, uh, Tom, you had a chance to make a presentation at the Prendergast Library and it was entitled Chautauqua Lake Management, the Partnership perspective of which um, we don't have the benefit of all the charts and that stuff, but really you identified sort of the three pieces that Jim has talked about. Do you want to kind of maybe do a reader's digest of what it is you were trying to accomplish that night? Well, we were trying to inform whoever came uh, of our perspective on management of Chautauqua Lake, and Jim has mentioned the three areas, weed management, uh, floating weed fragment man management, and harmful algae blooms. So those are the three. And um, we, we, as far as weeds go, uh, we are not opposed to harvesting. Um, we believe what the lake needs is, is a combination, a planned combination of harvesting, <coughs> excuse me, harvesting and herbicide use. And by planned, I mean uh, when in the, in the course of the season, spring, summer, fall, are you going to use these two methods and where. Um, and, and when it comes to weeds, you know, we're, we're very well aware of, of the difference between uh, the inv two invasive species uh, and the native species. And, um, so that's, that's, we tried to present that at the library. Uh, as far as floating fragments go. Now, you also talked about, just in that, that weed management section while we're, while we're discussing it, uh, 
uh, the Chautauqua Lake Partnership has been involved in certain weed surveys throughout there. Could you explain that, if you could, about what, what that is? What, what is a weed survey? Well, a weed survey uh, involves professionals uh, going out in a boat. And uh, the methods for surveying are different now from, from what we used in the 1970s, for example, during the benchmark study. Um, in the 70s, we did not have what's called the rake-toss method. Uh, we, we had uh, uh, circular frames that we put, they were made out of cast iron, so we put them on the bottom of the lake and they were either a square meter or a tenth of a square meter and we sent divers down and uh, literally pulled the weeds out of the bottom, uh, put them into bags, brought them up. Um, we knew how many weeds came out for each meter, square meter things of that type. Nowadays, uh, the survey methods uh, use a rake. Uh, it's actually two rakes, two regular, uh, not leaf rakes, but garden rakes, back to back, and they're on a rope, and you toss it, and you drag it through the bottom certain distance, and bring it up, and then you uh, collect and identify the weeds as to species, and uh, process them um, they can be dried, for example, get dry weights and so on. Uh, and uh, you do a certain number of rake tosses per acre. And not all weeds are created equal. Well, <laughs> um, so there's a variety of species and stuff like that. Do you have a sense of the number of types of species we have in the top of lake? Well, uh, about 30. About 30 is okay. what we're getting. In yeah, the I wouldn't have come up with that, that number because I tend to focus a little more. But uh, two of them are what we call invasives, and then the others, for the most part, are uh, our native species. As far as the, you know, before I get back to the other two, uh, you talked about timing. And how important this is, and, and I don't know if, uh, I'll just toss it up whether Jim or, or Tom going to talk about. I just received as an owner of the, on the lake uh, a letter of notification uh, of DEC permitting for application of aquatic herbicides Ac Aquathol K and uh, Navigate to target areas of Chautauqua Lake, certain parts of Chautauqua Lake, of which I, I am part of. And Part of that was to get notification out. I know that was just stated. Get it out earlier because of timing. Is how important is it for just the timing of the application uh, of th this type of herbicide? Is do you want to speak to that, Tom or Jim? Or? Sure. Um, we think timing is really important, and uh, it follows from the research that was done in support of the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement in 2018. Um, in that, we built mitigations into all our treatment plans so that really, there really aren't any additional mitigations to minimize or eliminate the environmental impacts that you might have otherwise. One of them is to do the herbicide treatments early. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is we want to eliminate the invasive weeds, which are all the ones that are targeted by the herbicides. The herbicides only eliminate the Eurasian water milfoil and the curly pond weed, the invasives that don't belong here and that outcompete all the natives. Um, and you like to do that early because if you do it early, then what falls to the bottom is a very small piece of weed. And we don't want to add any more decaying mass to what's on the bottom of the lake already. Because as, if, as you know, if you drop an anchor in a lot of places in the lake or you step on the bottom, we've got feet, several feet of decaying weeds on the bottom. They contribute phosphorus into the water column that feeds the algae and feeds the weeds. And also, if you do it early in the season when the water's cooler, uh, the dissolved oxygen in the water is much higher, which is good for the fish. Um, and 
decaying weeds uh, can use some of that up. So if you do it early, you have a lot more available in the water. Then there's a whole series of practical benefits of doing it early. One is uh, in late April or early May, which is our target, there really isn't, there aren't too many people using the lake. Um, so it doesn't really interfere uh, with use of the lake and any interference there is, is just for a day or two. You mentioned a swimming restriction that you remember as a kid. Um, nowadays, it's no more than 24 hours. How does the pro well, we're, I guess we're on the subject. I received this notification and it was an application submitted by the town of Ellery uh, to the DEC for the 2019 permitting. What's the process? You, 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 you said submit that, uh, what goes with the application? How, how does it work? Well, actually, in, in 2019, permit applications were submitted by the towns of Ellicott, Busti, North Harmony, and Ellery, and the villages of Celeron and Lakewood. Um, so there's a, a formal regulatory process that drives everything you do um, from the submission, the detail that's in the permit application, all the way through the review, and ultimately uh, to getting the permit and then doing the work. So it's a very structured process in New York State, um, driven by the State Environmental Quality Review Act, which is part of the New York State Conservation Law. And, and that structure basically determines um, what each of the towns and villages have to do uh, in order to get a permit and then implement it. In the most recent permit application of the various towns and villages, uh, it, it covers a, a portion of the lake. And, and just, I'm looking at a chart. Geographically, it really runs from uh, Bemis Point, Midway State Park, just south of that. Bemis Point, basically south. It, it does not cover the upper basin, more or less, does it? No, and in fact, what's on the map that's associated with the, with the letter of notification that's indic indicative of where water use restrictions are anticipated to be in place. And those are actually much further north and west of any area that's being treated. Um, on the other side of the lake, the furthest west or north uh, that anything's being applied for this year is in Sunset Bay. And on this side of the lake, the furthest north is just opposite Long Point in Stowe. So most of the treat treatment area that's proposed for 2019 is in the South Basin, uh, but there is some in the North Basin, and it goes as far north or west as those two locations. Tom, I cut you off. You're on the roll. Of, you got through the first one, weed management. We, we went down another the, the regulatory road, but. Yeah, you were starting to talk about weed fragment management. Well, <clears throat> weed fragments are, are primarily from the two invasive species, and, and of the two, uh, primarily from um, the uh, milfoil. And uh, the problem with, with milfoil fragments is that uh, when, the, when the fragments leave the plant, they drift for a while, they settle down, and when they settle to the bottom, they can take root and grow again. So uh, when, when you harvest, for example, and again, we're not opposed to harvesting, we just want it done in a planned manner. Um, when, when you do harvest, uh, the harvesters make every effort to collect all of the fragments, the harvested material that they can. Uh, they don't get it all. And uh, the fragments that of, of milfoil, again, that uh, drift around, settle to the bottom, can take root and propagate the plant. So uh, when, you, when you harvest, there is, so, to some extent, <coughs> plant propagation going on as well. Uh, harvesting isn't the only thing that breaks off fragments. Uh, storms can do that. Uh, when the weeds die, it, it happens. Uh, there, there's some evidence that uh, 
some of the three insects. We have three, three herbivorous in insects that uh, feed on the weeds in the, in the plant, in the lake, I should say. One of them is a caddisfly, uh, one of them is a moth, and one of them is a weevil. And it's important to keep in mind that it's the larvae, it's the immature stages of these three insects that do the job. Uh, it's not the adults. You know, flying moths and flying caterpillar, uh, caddisfly adults don't, don't do this. It's the larvae. But they also can break off uh, fragments that can drift around. Motorboats go through and do it. And these fragments then can propagate. Part of the weed fragment management, uh, you actually have encouraged the purchase of a some equipment, uh, the mobile track. As, as a, and I'm actually, I use the term, but what, you want to describe what a mobile track is? Well, we, Frank, uh, we, we've got uh, uh, Mike Latone out here who's actually driven one in Florida, but uh, I think Jim can do a better job of describing that than I because he's seen more of it in operation. Yeah, if you remember back to my experience in late 2015, I guess, when I had all that stuff on my shoreline, um, and the, the method that was used around the lake to manage shoreline fragments uh, was kids in the water with pitchforks uh, throwing it up on conveyors and taking it away that way. Um, and there really wasn't enough of it, it wasn't mechanized, it wasn't efficient. We were very concerned that with the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria, and the skin, respiratory, and liver toxins that they produce, that having kids in the water doing that without protective gear probably wasn't going to be sustainable, and it wasn't efficient enough. So we started looking, mainly Mike Latone, started looking at various types of equipment that uh, might do it more efficiently and keep the kids out of the water. And we looked at a variety of types of equipment and we landed on something called a Moby Track. And a Moby Track is a amphibious vehicle. You can use it in the water. It's got tracks on it, so you can actually move it into shallow water and it's got about a six foot wide rake on the front where you can go in, pick the stuff up, and either put it on a transport barge or put it on the shoreline and then haul it away. <clears throat> we were really glad to hear um, late last year that the county purchased one. Um, we had identified about $100,000 in grants uh, with Kathy Young, our senator, and Assemblyman Goodell back in early 2017. And ultimately the county used that money to buy the first one for use on Chautauqua Lake. And it's gonna be run by the town of Chautauqua for the benefit of the whole lake. So it should be on the lake this summer, um, working the shoreline particularly in various places around the lake. Then more recently, we've heard that the town of Chautauqua bought one of their own. Uh, so it looks like we're gonna have two on the lake in 20, 2019, which will be great. And um, we think ultimately we're gonna need about six of them. Um, and maybe some of the other towns and villages will do what Chautauqua did and use them in combination with the highway department equipment and personnel that they have um, to take care of the shoreline and the municipality in the summer. The other thing I mentioned though is there is the idea of picking up the fragments either from the shoreline or the ones that are floating out there and we're going to have to be doing that for a long time because uh, as Tom mentioned the fragments come from a whole series of sources but what I can tell you is that in Bemis Bay where we actually had a very limited herbicide treatment of milfoil and pondweed, her leaf pondweed in 2017, and then another one in 2018, what we found is that we had a much, much smaller load of fragments on the shoreline. In fact, 
we estimated that we only had about 10 percent of the fragments to pick up along the shoreline in the bay in 2018 than we did in 2017. So if you get to this optimal combination of weed harvesting and herbicides where you're using the right method in the right place at the right time, we really think that long term um, that will improve the floating mass of fragments as well as the ones that are ending up on the shoreline. Have you seen an increase of water skiers in front of Bemis Bay you know, now that you're doing? <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure everybody's happy about that. Um, but yes, we de definitely have more people coming into the bay um, and, uh, and utilizing it. Well, you know, tourism destination, I like it. I like yeah. it. So, Tom, we're now into phase three of the Chautauqua Lake Management Partnership Perspective, the LG Management. And uh, it's one of your main thrusts <coughs> under your comprehensive strategy. You want to explain that to what, what, what that really, what's that part of the component of your uh, strategy? Well, uh, in some respects, I'm a biological dinosaur. I know some of my former colleagues have called me that. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, I, I will we don't call them that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say that uh, when I first, I have a, I have, I, my doctorate and master's are in, in zoology effectively, but I have a botany minor and I love teaching botany. Uh, Becky Nystrom, who's sitting out there, uh, <coughs> took over, which was one of the great disappointments in my life because I really did love teaching botany. But, um, <clears throat> that I got off into geology anyway. But you are happy that Becky's doing it right now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's not the issue. Um, <laughs> but I had to do something else so I got off into geology, but that's another story. Um, and when, when I first started learning botany, uh, we talked about, uh, a, well, the different groups of algae are generally commonly, commonly named by their colors meaning their pigments. So you have green algae and brown algae and red algae. And we had one called blue-green algae. And, uh, it was, you know, we, it was an alga. And uh, then time went by and, and more was learned. So uh, what happened was we, people began to realize that it wasn't an alga at all. It was, it was a simpler type of a cell. It's actually a bacteria. So even though some of us dinosaurs still call it blue-green algae, we do recognize that it's blue-green bacteria, also called cyanobacteria. Cyano meaning blue-green. Uh, and uh, the cyanobacteria, as, as Jim mentioned briefly, uh, they, some species are toxic. They produce toxins. And the toxins can affect humans and our pets, and uh, <coughs> there is a major thrust worldwide now, uh, not just in this country, but worldwide, uh, to try to understand and control cyanobacteria or blue-green bacteria. Uh, <coughs> we have a former JCC student that went on to get a doctorate, and he is teaching uh, uh, lake management focusing on blue-green bacteria now in, in Korea, South Korea. So JCC people are, are around the world. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but well, it, there's it, a second part. Well, there's a second part to it, but you actually convened recently a group of scientists uh, in January, I believe, uh, to kind of take thought processes and scientists from outside the area to talk about a variety of things that occur in the lake, but I, I suspect you're focusing in on the algae bloom. Uh, you want to speak to your, the, sure. the group? Let, 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 me, let me begin uh, with, with New York State. Uh, New York State a year or so ago um, started a big effort to understand and manage harmful algae blooms, and 12 lakes were picked around the state. Uh, there are three of them here in the western zone. Chautauqua Lake is one of them. And uh, <coughs> there, was a, there was regional conferences on that. Uh, we've had local meetings on that. Um, we've been looking at 
cyanobacteria here in Chautauqua County for several years, actually. Uh, for a time, we had a small work group. Um, and uh, that preceded the state effort. But um, the state uh, is focusing on this, and one of the individuals that on the state level uh, is a biologist from Bowling Green State University, Dr. Tim Davis. And uh, he has been joined at Bowling Green uh, by Dr. George Bullerjohn. And the two of them, now both at Bowling Green State University, uh, were uh, here for a one-day conference at the Lawson Center on uh, January 26th, I think. 10th. Yeah, January 10th. Um, and uh, they have achieved, I believe it's a $5.2 million grant to study harmful algae blooms in the western part of Lake Erie. Uh, they're working with several other universities, not just Bowling Green. Uh, but uh, we, they were here and uh, they uh, will be working with us on some of our harmful algae bloom efforts uh, in the coming year or probably more. Jim, how would you describe what, when you talk about working group, because I know I've talked to Professor Neckers uh, uh, who sort of convened that, that group here. Uh, how do you see that playing out? Is there some top talent, Lake Erie, yeah. and here? Yeah, the uh, doctors Boulogian and Davis that Tom mentioned, um, they they got a big grant from the National Science Foundation to found the Lake Erie Center for uh, Freshwater and Human Health. And it's really focused on the harmful algae bloom problem in western Lake Erie. Uh, the center itself includes nine universities, Michigan State, uh, University of Michigan, Ohio State, North Carolina, Kentucky, SUNY ESF, and Syracuse, a whole series of universities that are focused on this problem. Um, we started working that with them. Uh, Dr. Neckers is an organic chemist who's part of our partnership organization as well. He's one of our volunteers. And he had a relationship with these professors. And so really beginning over a year ago, we developed a relationship with them. And they got real interested in doing using Chautauqua Lake as a prototype for an approach to algae management in our lake and then ultimately in Western Lake Erie. And it involves focusing on the primary nutrient that feeds the algae, which is phosphorus. In 2012, the EPA and the DEC did a study in Chautauqua Lake, and they identified that phosphorus coming from the bottom of the lake was the source that was most important to reduce. In fact, it represented 55% of the required reduction the stuff that's coming from the bottom. This is legacy phosphorus that's built up over the decades, as well as that that's being produced by decaying weeds. So uh, the Lake Erie Center, their approach, and it's all developed now and it's in grant applications. Uh, they're looking for money to fund it. But the idea is to put a number of phosphorus sensors in the lake uh, go out and pick them up and download them every couple of weeks and move them around and ultimately develop what I call a contour map of phosphorus in the water column around the lake. And then we'll go in and focus in on the hot spots where the phosphorus is the heaviest in the water column and we'll go in and take uh, the phosphorus bearing sediments off the bottom in those areas and take them out of the lake. So the phase one is developing the contour map to identify the hot spots. The phase two, which will involve the Army Corps of Engineers, but we've had several meetings with in Pittsburgh, will be to take it off the bottom. And I think uh, County Executive Borello uh, might have talked about this some um, when he was here a few weeks ago. I think 
he used another term instead of hot spots it was like hot buttons or something that I read in one of Eric's articles um, but it's the same thing so that's really what we're working on we've entered into a, an agreement to work with the Lake Erie Center on this again using Chautauqua Lake as a prototype for what they would ultimately apply in Western Lake Erie a total aside but an interesting development in the Toledo area dealing with this is an effort to identify and, and have legislation where Lake Erie would be quote a person for capable of applying for grants suing to have standing essentially it's a legal standing issue I was a unique argument it's out there there we can read it you can google it um, who knows that I actually had an email saying gee why doesn't Chautauqua Lake become a person and then they can yeah, yeah great then we can have more lawsuits <laughs> good for lawyers um, do you as you look forward to 2019 and the Chautauqua Lake partnership and uh, again I'll toss this up what is what's your mission here this year what do you hope to accomplish uh, in, in this time time period so next year if we came back and you had a chance, we said, hey, what did you accomplish in 2019? What do you hope to say? Well, looking at our, our three main thrusts, <coughs> um, we have applied, as you know, and commented on uh, for permits for herbicide use in the lake. Uh, we hope to accomplish that. Uh, we hope to uh, work with the town of Chautauqua and the county um, with the Moby Track and hope to get more Moby tracks and work on floating fragment management. And uh, with, with our Bowling Green connection, um, we hope to uh, try to understand a little more about the blue green algae. There I go again, the cyanobacteria problem in, uh, in Chautauqua Lake. Um, and I've said before, and I'll say it again, you know, it, it's really understanding cyanobacteria, understanding that problem that, that is the, the great need right now. So those three things, again, that, those are our thrusts. I just mentioned that there's also another uh, study that we're entering into with SUNY Buffalo. Uh, SUNY Buffalo's engineering department, and also their Renew Institute. And the Renew Institute is an environmental and economics institute. And those two organizations up at SUNY Buffalo are gonna be working with Chautauqua County Soil and Water Conservation District. And they wanna do a study of the socioeconomic and environmental impacts and benefits of agricultural runoff. And agricultural runoff is the second most important phosphorus source uh, that needs to be reduced in the lake. So we really have these, the partnership has partnerships with these two sets of universities that are really focused on the algae problem. One other point I'd like to make about our initiatives, the partnerships initiatives, um, and we alluded to it a little bit when we talked about weed management. Um, our initiatives really complement the ones that are being pursued by other lake organizations. Um, as we mentioned with weed management, we think the optimal and really the only way that you can effectively manage invasive weeds in Chautauqua Lake um, is an optimal combination of weed harvesting and herbicides. Um, the same thing is true really for uh, weed fragment management. Uh, the Chautauqua Lake Association uh, has purchased um, some new pieces of equipment that are going to be focused on gathering up fragments in open water. Um, we think that fits real well with a mechanized shoreline effort like we're encouraging and uh, the county has got behind and the town of Chautauqua as well. And in the last area of algae management, there's been, there is and there's been a lot going on in the watershed for years and years to try to reduce what's coming in. Um, 
Tom and I are both on the South and Center Sewer District Board, along with Beer, um, Karen. Karen, we're extending the sewers in that end of the lake and the other end of the lake. That's one of the initiatives to reduce phosphorus from that source. The Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy does a lot of work up in the watershed on stream bank stabilization and, and other types of education. Um, but in the case of nutrients and algae management, we're currently the only ones that are focusing on that loading in the lake. Um, so all these programs do complement each other. Um, and uh, so I just think it's important to note that. County Executive George Burrell, who was here two weeks ago with, with Dave, uh, has uh, involved himself in his office in, in an effort which uh, is a new initiative that had not heretofore happened, and no disrespect to what happened in the prior administrations for many, many years, uh, with a goal towards gathering consensus among the various organizations. Uh, is that, uh, what, what do you think the speed bump for George to achieve that, if anything? I don't know, what, what did he tell you? <laughs> I don't think he said he was just okay. that, that's um, aspirational. Yeah, that's first aspirational. first of all, I think we say we're, uh, the, the consensus strategy that he's seeking is for weed management, okay? So it's focused on that first one of the focus areas that the partnership has. Um, and uh, we're very encouraged by it. Um, the county's hired a consultant, and the consultant has convened a number of focus groups uh, that we've been involved with and all the other organizations have been involved with to gather information. Um, and we're real hopeful that that results in something <coughs> Um, that everybody can agree with because, again, our objective is the optimal combination of weed harvesting and herbicides in the lake. And those are the two primary weed management methods that can work in a lake this size. So if there's anything George can do, and I believe there is, uh, to support the appropriate organizations getting together towards that end, um, we're certainly supportive. Tom, as we draw closure, I want to give you an opportunity to, you should have been sitting there saying, I wonder if Greg's ever going to ask that question. Is there something that I have failed to ask you today that you just want to answer? Pretend that a rhetorical question. <clears throat> How much time do I have to think? <laughs> Um, well, being primarily a zoologist, uh, the animal life of the lake has not been discussed here. So uh, I guess I would have to say uh, our, three, our three thrusts, how might they affect the zoology, the animal life of the lake? And do you have, a, do you have a Reader's Digest that? answer to that? Am I supposed to answer that? Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to answer that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, um, I will say this, that, that in the many times we, Jim and I and others, uh, have been up to meet with the Conservation Department in Buffalo over our projects uh, and permits and so on and so forth. Many, many times. Uh, the, um, the Conservation Department does a very good job of, of monitoring uh, the effects of some of our goals on the animal life in the lake, particularly fish. Uh, they're concerned about mussels. They're concerned about spiny softshell turtles. Uh, and, you know, as a zoologist, I am too. Uh, I, I rely very strongly on uh, the experts that we have <coughs> working with us, uh, lake management firm known as Solitude, who have extensive experience 
not just in New York State, but throughout the Northeast and on down into Florida. Um, and uh, also the, the chemical companies that produce the herbicides. Uh, these herbicides that we, we have used and propose to use uh, have all undergone their own independent environmental quality review studies. And the, the quantities of the herbicides that are applied, the methods of application, the dilution factors, you know, this is not spraying from an airplane that we did in the 60s on, on the pine forest of Wisconsin. Uh, you know, the technology has changed drastically. And uh, I have great confidence that the herbicide application, the herbicides themselves, the technology associated with the application uh, are going to be done properly and that that will not have a significant effect on the animal life of Chautauqua Lake. Jim, you have the final word on the Chautauqua Lake Partnership question that you hoped I would have asked and happened. Or if you want to just sort of wrap up on the, uh, the Chautauqua Lake Partnership and sure. its perspective. Yeah, I, I think what I'd like to just talk a little bit about is, is excuse me, is our organization. Um, you know, I talked about some numbers of people that we now have as members and on our distribution list. But the core group is really a group of about 10 or 12 people now. And uh, we have doctors, um, we have scientists, PhD scientists, we have engineers, not just me, but we got another one, Jody Johnson, that's got about three engineering degrees. Um, and then we got a lot of people with administrative experience, um, and we're all volunteers. Okay, nobody gets paid. Um, and really, all the money that we, we gather uh, has primarily come from individuals and businesses, local foundations, and municipalities. Um, we're in the process of getting more from the state and the county, um, but basically we have to do a lot of work on fundraising. Um, and that's done with volunteers as well. So we have Jim Service, who's our president. Uh, we have Mike Latone, who's our treasurer. We have Becca Haynes, who's our secretary. I'm the vice president. Uh, we got Tom, a uh, PhD biologist, one of our science advisors. Doug Neckers, a PhD organic chemist, who's our chemistry advisor. And we got Jody Johnson, who is a multiple engineering degree person. Um, we got Frank Nicotra, a uh, former school superintendent. Um, we've got Craig Butler, uh, with a lot of experience in property management and real estate. We have, who am I missing? Uh, Tom Turner, back here who's actually working with Sarah Demink right now on our fundraising campaign. Um, so that group um, is very active. Um, most of us talk to each other pretty much every day. I know Tom gets tired of me calling him and Mary knows before I say anything if I'm calling. Um, and I would just like to say thank you to all those folks because like I said, nobody gets paid. It's all volunteer, and most of these folks have been working on this for two years now. And we can't forget Karen Ryan, who started the original CLP back in 2000. Okay. Well, I want to thank you folks for giving us the time to give us a real insight into the Chautauqua Lake Partnership. I, I note your letterhead it says Chautauqua Lake, a great lake seeking a greater future as, as your mantra. And uh, I want to thank Tom, Jim, and also the Chautauqua Lake Partnership. And many of them are here today for making this part of the series uh, a very informative, incredibly insightful. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you.